Live from the beautiful sun-kissed island of Kauai, it's Animal Talking. Today, join Gary and his guests, Tom Nichols, Cliff Blazinski, and LD Shadow Lady. And now, still not brought to you by Chicken and a Biscuit, here's your host, Gary Witta. Blew my cue right off the bat. Blew it right off the bat, Adam. Right off the bat. That's great. Every, every show, you 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 do something with your wardrobe that I that is beyond my comprehension. Can you please tell me what is going on today? In Canada, it is Victoria Day, which is some sort of celebration of the Queen. Maybe? Okay. Our own dear queen, Elizabeth II. Adam, are you in the turnip market this week? Did you buy any turnips yesterday? I have a full load. Of course you do. Of course you do. This is the first week I'm I'm out of the market this week. I'm out of the market. No turnips for me. So, so if so you that's... get a code, uh, you know. Oh, you, but you, you still want me to look out for a code for you? Yes. yes All right, I, I'll see, I'll, I noticed that um, a former guest and friend of the show, I, Justine, she's been sending you quite a few things in the mail it's almost like your pen pals now it all started as i was uh just kind of sending her garbage every single time i've sent her something she has outdone me which culminated in the literal mailing of a poo to me yesterday yeah capture cards out of sync hold on a second stand by here we go here we go nothing is uh messed up uh well that is we have to fix that card hold on a second <laughs> Professor Tom Nichols, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. You can stop clapping, Adam. He's impressive, but you don't have to go over the top. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> what is the deal with you and Indian food? You started like a, 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 tweet, a Twitter firestorm when you spoke out against Indian food. Oh, oh dear God, of all the things I have ever said <laughs> in my life. Yeah, you've managed to annoy this... everybody, not just like one half yeah, of the food, I mean, everybody. <laughs> But I said, you know, Indian food is terrible and we pretend it isn't. And people jumped all over me for saying, oh, you know, you're saying that everybody who likes it is lying. And I was mostly thinking of my colleagues who always, you know, when we're out in Boston, you know, they say, let's go for Indian food. And then they're like sweating and they're wiping the sweat off their face because the food is so hot. And I would always say to them, you can't possibly be having a good time. This looks like work, you know, um, and that's all I meant. Look, I'm from New England. We think boiled potatoes are a little on the racy side if we have too much salt on them. I think anytime something happens like this, it's all very silly. Like, you know, these big arguments on the, on the Internet, uh, what's the right way to cut a grilled cheese or just let people like what they like and mind your own business. Professor of National Security Affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. That is a very, very impressive title you sound you sound a little bit like you're a real life jack ryan how how accurate is that description i am totally jack ryan except for being not being a marine or handsome um do you have a security clearance is that something you can even talk about then i'd have to kill you but <laughs> yes um, <clears throat> it's critical thinking um we want them to be able to think beyond their particular um, expertise. They're going to have to understand their own government. They're going to have to understand things like bureaucracy, international organizations. You want to talk about nuclear weapons? I'm your man. M makes for a nice holiday, warm discussion over the dinner table. Oh, yeah. Well, just, just, just what um, we like here on a Monday morning here on Animal Talking. Yeah. <laughs> In my view, the internet has led to this wonderful, wonderful democratization of, of opinion that's allowed everyone to have a voice and have a platform. But it's also kind of leveled the playing field in a way in which everyone's opinion now seems to carry equal weight regardless of how educated or informed they actually are. We see this now every day on social media. We're seeing it now during the pandemic. But you seem to see this coming before anyone else. You wrote a whole book about this uh, a few years ago. Some younger person I was talking to about Snowden, uh, Edward Snowden and Russia, and this, this guy didn't like what I was saying. And he said, Tom, I don't think you understand Russia. Let me explain Russia to you. Uh, after, you know, 30 years of speaking Russian and, you know, just, writing I mean, books about Russia. Doesn't that just make you want to pull your hair out when, when some random on Twitter tries to explain things to you that you studied your entire life? We've become a very narcissistic society. We just can't believe that we're ever wrong about anything. We don't like anybody correcting us. We don't like to think that anybody in the room is smarter than we are. Here is the book. It's called The Death of Expertise, The Campaign Against Established Knowledge and why it matters. It's a really, really fascinating book. Big Anime Booty in the chat asks the question, can you ask Tom why, why he hates Led Zeppelin? Here, here's the thing, you know, I, I, I don't like Led Zeppelin. I, I accept their awesomeness 
as a band, it's just not my cup of tea. You know when it's time to get a new PC, Gary, is when you have enough money. Then it's always time to get a new <laughs> PC. And yes, that's a Sound Blaster uh, AE7 card in there because I'm, um, you know, because I'm old school and I still put sound cards and things. By the way, somebody in the chat said, who knew Sound Blaster even existed? I'm shaking my old guy <laughs> fist at you, whoever you are. Cliff Blazinski, Cliffy B, thank you so much for joining us here today on Animal Talking. Thank you for having me, Gary. It's uh, kind of an honor. Let's talk about Jazz Jackrabbit. What was the origin of Jazz Jackrabbit? You know, being an 80s kid, uh, my parents got a VCR and they showed us all sorts of movies that were incredibly inappropriate for our, our ages, uh, being, you know, young and wet behind the ears. And uh, one of the ones that they showed us was Rambo, First Blood Part Two. And at the time, character action platformers were all the rage. Uh, everything from Mario and Sonic uh, all the way through to even stupid Bubsy. Here's okay. the quote from the show. Cliff Buzinski throws Bubsy under the bus. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> throwing shade at Bubsy. I wanted to make my own character action platform game. And, you know, it made me enough money so that I could move out of my mother's house in uh, Laverne, California, where she was not running the air conditioning ever. And it would get to 110 degrees and she'd say, just, op just open a window, Clifford. And I think the thing that you're probably most well known for is, of course, creating... Gears of War. You, you, Cliffy B, created one of the one of the, a franchise which is still now today one of the pillars of the Xbox franchise. When people say, "Oh, like you know, what's Xbox got?" They go, "Well, you know, Halo, Forza, Gears of War. Like it's right up there with you know, it's it's a it's a quadruple, quintuple A franchise." It's so weird because every day somebody tweets me and says, make make Gears great again. Like, I'm some sort of, like, silver bullet. The thing is, when the franchise was sold, um, I literally got a phone call from Phil Spencer, who runs Xbox, to tell me about it, you know? And I love Tim and Mark from Epic dearly, but they didn't call and tell me, you know? And, and, but Phil Phil's a classy guy, and Phil, you know, called me and told me, and, and it was really, like, one of those, like, character-establishing moments. For the first couple of years, it was a blast. We were making a fun first person shooter a lot of the programmers who were also acting as game designers were fans of uh, MOBAs at the time uh, you know and they wanted to give the characters abilities and have unique characters and uh, I remember the first unveiling video uh, for Overwatch which looked great and I remember uh, the programmer Matt looking and being his jaw was just dropping and I was like now we know what not to do and we still had the characters we still had the abilities but I didn't want to clone the same exact abilities that Overwatch did Activision Blizzard, you know, puts a bazillion dollars into making Overwatch the next phenomenon, along with insanely beautiful Pixar quality cinematics. Uh, good luck with that. And uh, you basically, you know, it, it, we were walking into a storm, a, a deal that wasn't quite as, you know, amazing with like an Activision or an EA, the old school guard may have made more sense than having this amazing deal with this uh, Korean company because, you know, at the time, Nexon US seemed to really not really have any idea what they were doing and it was a bit of a revolving door. The marketing plan would change, you know, like, you know, I'd get a new PR person all the time. Like, you know, my problem in regards to when I, the way that I work is I'm too nice. You know, I, I'm like, okay, like, let you go ahead and just run with those ideas. Like, I never really liked MOBAs and like, I didn't really think the characters and abilities. I wanted to make kind of a, 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 like more of a classic arena shooter. I had such a hard time even selling that, even though I was the primary owner of the, and the CEO. It was one of the hardest things to actually happen to me in my entire life. It was almost harder than losing my father when I was 10 years old. Um, because, you know, I was cocky, I was brash. Um, and I was just assuming that if I just, you know, faked it until I made it, even though I'd already made it, that the game would be a hit. And, uh, you know, I, I'll never forget, like, watching the, the concurrent users kind of just start to plummet. And you know, it's what it is as good as Overwatch is, you know, being a hardcore shooter fan, there were things that just bothered me about it. You know, the little bits of auto aim and, you know, the, 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 the collision boxes and things like that, you know, things about the movement, uh, the chaos that was going on. And, and people like to try and pinpoint one thing in regards to, they're like, oh, it's an Overwatch clone. I'm like, uh, we were developing it at the same time as Overwatch, there's no way we could have suddenly scrambled and made the exact same game as per your perception. This industry has been really, really good to me, but I've also seen the damage that it can bring on game developers. I've seen families ruined. I've seen people with, you know, uh, substance abuse issues. Um, I've seen, you know, people, you know, having to go to therapy, you know, working so many hours, you know, and whatnot. You know, and just for the, the privilege of saying they worked in a video game, it does bother me a little bit that the game developer who's making a decent salary at a studio isn't going to see the multi-million dollar windfall that some kid playing his game in an esports tournament is going to get. And the indie space is so swamped. Like, good luck actually, like, you know, cutting through the noise in that space. 
like I said, it's like facing Dark Link. It's fighting yourself and your 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 wins and your losses. Uh, you know, I'm not always the hero of it. You know, I was a uh, you know a piece of crap in my prior relationships. Um, and I'm go I'm gonna just put it all out there. And it's it's kind of terrifying to do that, dude. Are we gonna is there are we gonna see Cliff Blazinski back in the world of games anytime? Uh, I wouldn't say soon. Uh, I do have a new IP that I'm formulating on. The way that I work generally is I start with the character, I start with the world, uh, and then I work outward from that, and then I kind of figure out the game mechanics. Sit back and enjoy uh, the DJ stylings of our resident house DJ, DJ Cupcakes. <laughs> Cupcakes absolutely killing it. And I think we're definitely doing that right now. Oh, she's big. Get sorry. <laughs> get back up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> she can help herself. LD Shadow Lady Lizzie, thank you so much for joining us on the show. And oh, well, thanks for having me. I've just got to say, I love the musical stylings. Oh my God. She's going to be so thrilled to hear that. She is seriously like your number one, number one. And I'm not even kidding. I know you've got some big fans, but I feel confident in saying that my daughter, the seven-year-old DJ Cupcakes, is the biggest fan of yours. She watches your videos incessantly. All I hear around my house is LD Shadow Lady said this, LD Shadow Lady did that. It's it, but you've been an inspiration to her. I think one of the reasons that she respond that she loves you is you get you seem to get up you seem to get up to a lot of mischief. Yeah, I do like I like a bit of cheeky behavior on Minecraft. <laughs> kind of the one place you can get away with being a bit a bit evil and everyone just writes it off as oh it's just a fun prank. Behold, my naval fleet. <laughs> this is embarrassing. And you found success at a very young age and you started even younger. You were like what 18 when you first started messing around on YouTube and playing games? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had a YouTube account probably since I was about 14. That was when I first discovered YouTube. And I've had, you know, I've been through all the phases. I, I made little music videos with my friends and I, you know, wrote little plays and we would act them out. So I had channels like that, but it wasn't until I found gaming that I found something I really enjoyed and that I was somewhat good at. Even, you know, when I was starting my YouTube channel, I didn't think it would become what it is today. Hence the terrible username that is just not catchy at all. I don't, it, I thought, you know, my sniper montages were just something the world needed to see. And it wasn't until I kind of realized that I was actually really bad at Call of Duty. Uh, these sniper montages should be hidden from view and never seen again. When I first started my YouTube channel, it was, I, I, I hosted my sad uh, PUBG clips. You recently hit a very, very uh, big milestone. You recently celebrated five million subscribers to your channel yeah i mean i don't even where did all these people come from i don't know because you know i just sit in my room and play fit games and it, it doesn't feel real when they're just uh kind of graphics displayed on a screen because you can't see five million people you know you don't go i don't go and do concerts i don't do tours where i see people i, I occasionally have meet and greets and even even that is a small fraction of the people that have actually chosen to subscribe to me over the time i remember hitting one million, and I, then I thought, gosh, I, I never thought this would happen. This is insane. This, my life has peaked here. It's never gonna get better <laughs> than this. And to, so to tell me, you know, four years later or so that I'd be hitting five million subscribers is just really hard to comprehend. You also have a very, very nice community. There are many, many of your fans in the chat right now who are super supportive of you. What, what, is, what is the secret to, to fostering a good community? Um, I think the most important thing for me was how I conduct myself online and to, to make sure that I'm being a good role model for how we should all treat each other online. And somebody will post a fan edit of some pictures of me and, and all the other people that run the fan accounts will go to that post and they'll really cheer them on and um, say, oh, you're doing a great job. Like, this is really cool. I hope she sees this. They're not tearing each other down. They're, they're building each other up and they're helping each other. And I think that's just the nicest thing to see about the community. And I wish I could take credit for that, but honestly, it's not me, it's them. <laughs> Lizzie got a cool halo and I got asked why a billion people hate me. Well, Tom, you if you conducted know. yourself on Twitter more like more like Lizzie here, you might have a, you might have a halo by now. You don't, um, you don't see Lizzie so. going around slagging off Indian food and Led Zeppelin. That's why she's got five million uh, followers. I just want to know why I look like a SoundCloud rapper. You know why, Cliffy? Because your Wi-Fi sucks. It's a, it's a big house, Gary. <laughs> I will do about two or three conventions a year, maybe where, you know, we go and it, it's kind of special to be treated that way. You know, you get called the talent and you get escorted around by some big bodyguards and, you know, you get code names and all this kind of stuff. And it is a very niche sort of fame 
that it is only when I go to these conventions. If I want to go shopping with my husband, you know, we can go and do our groceries in our sweatpants and nobody knows who we are. And that's perfect because I don't think I could deal with the kind of fame where people are taking pictures of you and judging what you're wearing all the time. And By the way, Adam, you know who does owe me money? Mary Kish from Twitch. Oh my God. She came on my show and uh, she was a very nice guest, but then on the way out, she shook my money trees, stole my bells and bragged about it on my bulletin board and she won't give me the money back. I talked to her yesterday, she's not giving it back. I'll disappear from YouTube for weeks at a time sometimes and it does really an annoy some of my viewers and I completely understand why that stability, because they're so used to all of the other YouTubers that they watch being so consistent and I'm just, I'm just awful at it. I, I always, I'm always quite open about it though. I will always say like YouTube for me, I still want to, I still want to enjoy doing it at the end of the day. And I don't want to get, get this burnout that so many YouTubers talk about. And I don't ever want YouTube to become a chore to me or something that I hate doing or, you know, drive it into the ground. But I'm I, honestly, I'm, I, I'm thrilled that I booked you anyway, because you've really cheered me up as well. You've been a wonderful guest. Tom and Cliffy, you've been all right as well. But LD Shadow Lady, clearly the star of the show here. Uh, uh, what's brown and sticky? I don't know what? what is brown and sticky. A stick. All right. It's a classic. It's a classic, Adam. <laughs> I was I, I went out to the street the other day and we had a lot of rain and there was a lot of mud and I was checking the mail and I was of course social distancing and this truck went by and like with huge tires and just sprayed mud all over my shoes. So the only guy that I know to get shoes from right now is my drug dealer. So I went and got some shoes from him and I'll tell you, I don't know what he laced them with, but I was tripping all day. Oh all right, okay. Oh, all right. Wow. So Gorbachev goes to visit Reagan. And Reagan, to impress him, takes him to the Oval Office and uh, shows him this red phone. And he picks it up and he calls hell and he talks to the devil. And he says, check that out. And he hands it to Gorbachev and Gorbachev's just blown away. Reagan hangs up the phone and the phone rings back. And Gorbachev hears the White House operator say, that'll be $3 million, please. And Reagan says, bill it to the White House. Gorbachev goes back to Moscow. He says, I got to have me one of these phones. Reagan has one of these phones. I've got to have one. So they call in all these Soviet engineers. They sink a big hole. They put this red phone in. Gorbachev calls all his colleagues and he says, watch this. And he picks up this phone and he calls hell and he calls the devil. And everybody's real impressed. He hangs up the phone. The phone rings back and it's the Kremlin operator saying, that'll be five kopecks, please. Gorbachev says, sure, you know, charge it to the Kremlin. And just before he hangs up, he says, hey, wait a minute. How come Reagan calls us $3 million? I call it five kopecks. And the operator says, well, over there, it's long distance. Here, it's just a local call. All right, oh okay. God. All right, <laughs> all right. I can, I, can see that, I can see how that would be very popular in, in, in Soviet Russia. A drum set, well, a full set of cymbals and everything falls over the edge of a cliff. Badum tish. Oh. <laughs> What did the secret agent cow say to the other? Oh my God, I, I don't know. Are you utter cover? <laughs> Thank God you told that joke, Adam. I honestly thought I was gonna have the worst one. And Liz there it is, there it I is. The, 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 the vote is closed. Lizzie with 42% of the vote. <laughs> Professor Tom Nichols, Cliff Blazinski, LD Shadow Lady. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Uh, for me, uh, for Adam Nickerson, uh, for Leah Witter, for Kate Stark, uh, all of our moderators. Thank you, thank you so much. All oh, these goddamn lights, Adam, I gotta fix these lights. I have to fix, I'm taking that light down right after the show. There we go.